name is Greg Pass. I'm with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is June the 3rd, 2022, and I'm in Reading, Pennsylvania at World War II weekend. I had the pleasure to have a gentleman named Herman, who I'm not going to try to say his last name because I don't want to offend him by saying it wrong. Um, Herman, thanks for coming um, into the RV to tell us your story. Can you uh, tell us your full name and where you were born? Okay, my name is Herman with two N's, important. And middle initial R, last name Pfister. I was born in Essen, Germany, E-S-S-E-N. And what year were you born? 1934. 1934. Okay, so you have an interesting story to tell. Um, tell us your childhood memories and, and your participation at the time or um, your... I don't want to say involvement, but tell us about your childhood. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was born in 1934, as I said, and which was the beginning of the Hitler era in Germany. Uh, a lot of people uh, were very happy to uh, for Hitler to come on the scene because in the in the 20s, late 20s, Germany had uh, high inflation. I remember seeing money bills with one million printed on it and you couldn't even buy a loaf of bread for it. And obviously in the late 20s uh, there were problems like worldwide, like over here too, with uh, people out of work. So when Hitler came, he must have had an idea to uh, uh, to bring up the army and, and, and uh, which most of us, uh, my parents obviously did, did not understand in the beginning, but uh, he got the whole country uh, working. Everybody was happy, everybody made money, everybody was busy. And then, uh, obviously, when 1939 came, then people realized uh, what was what. That uh, this guy's, well, the guy was a little crazy, and uh, he took on the, all, the whole world, you know, knowing later on what happened. But my kids' years, uh, as a young kid, uh, I was very happy. Uh, I. Uh, uh, I remember the outbreak of the war. I, I was in first grade. Uh, the first year was not that bad. The, the bombers hadn't come and, and uh, you know, bombed the cities. And then as time went by, 1940, late 40, early 41, the uh, bombing started at night. And where did you live? In Essen. Essen is an uh, industrial town, is probably or was the biggest industrial town in Germany. And that where all the Krupp factories were located. Krupp was, was the ammunition and maker and, and war supplies. So the whole town of 750,000 people, not everybody worked for him, but a, a big part because the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ground where, where these factories were built, was there were acres and acres and acres of, of uh, uh, of factories uh, making, you know, German military stuff. So uh, my father's business was uh, right in the beginning where you went into these complexes where the factories were, and uh, I lived about three blocks away. Now when the war was started and they started bombing, obviously they tried to hit the Krupp factories. My father's business was destroyed three times and we lost our house uh, twice. So uh, as the war progressed uh, and the bombing started uh, during the daytime, it wasn't fun anymore in Germany because you know you constantly ran into bunkers, especially at night. I slept in a bunker. My mom took me every night from six till uh, six in the morning. Uh, and then, of course, when the bombing started during the daytime, it was a little different. By that time, the, the Germans had built uh, concrete uh, bunkers on the uh, on above ground, so you didn't have to go too far and, and go a hundred feet uh, in the ground for for uh, you know the safety of the bombing. Uh, my town had a lot of coal mines, so it was very easy to to uh, convert some of the coal mines into bunkers and they had uh, uh, benches in the middle and on the sides that they, they dug out uh, some holes in the wall and made kind of beds for the little kids 
So when you brought your children, you know, at six o'clock at the evening, you could, after you fed them somehow, you, you uh, put them into the war where, where the bed was and they could sleep all night. So, so that part was, was very well figured out. Now, obviously I was, uh, I was too old for that. And uh, I remember sitting uh, in these bunkers and, and because a coal mine in the German mines, there's constantly water coming, no matter how, how deep you are. And uh, so in the middle, it, had, it, it was kind of uh, uh, curvy. So the water could run, but over the, over the, over the water, they made benches and that's so you could sit. So, but uh, the water kept running underneath from the dripping, whatever, you know, so. And, and that wasn't too nice for being a kid. You know, it was cold and, and damp and, and, and even so you were a hundred feet in the ground, you could hear the bombs exploding because everything shook. Uh, how scary was that for them? How old were you at this time? When it started, uh, I, I was uh, uh, seven. Fighting is that for a seven-year-old well, boy? The thing is that I always, I always think about it. Was I afraid or was I not afraid? The thing is that your mom takes you and pushes you and pulls you. And we got to hurry up. The bombs are falling, this and that. And because of the way that went, you kind of got scared. You, you. Uh, otherwise, I saw sometimes it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's what I say. You know, I say it the way it is. And, and uh, there was no school uh, when I was in second grade. Uh, we had recess at nine o'clock and till 10 after nine. As soon as we were back in the, in the classroom, a ring of a, B, a B-17 ended up in a schoolyard where we were just playing the last, you know, where we were there for the 10 minutes with two motors on it. I never found out because, you know, at seven years, people don't tell you much. I never found out where the rest of the airplane went. But the parents, they got so excited and they said that, that makes no sense. So there was no more school after that. So for a year and a half, basically, uh, uh, I had schooling and I didn't have schooling. Uh, about a year later, uh, uh, Hitler decided that to save the youth because all this, the 18, from 18 on up to 55, they were fighting in the war. So somebody must have told Hitler, well, you know, we, we need uh, Germany, we need people in Germany. So uh, they took me away from my parents and sent me to the southern part of Germany with seven other kids and they sent me to Württemberg. The town was called Denkingen, and, and uh, it was farmland. And that wasn't bombed, but there was nothing. They bombed it later on, near the end of the war, and I'll tell you what happened there. Uh, but in general, you know, if they bombed the fields, the potatoes flying around or something, that was about it, because there was nothing to bomb. Mm -hmm. But uh, till the end of the war, they had, uh, fighter planes, in especially late 44 and the beginning of 45, they had uh, sections where they had uh, fighter planes flying around. And all the fighter planes, their job was not to let anybody walk, drive, do anything on farmlands, okay? So they would fly around for, I would say, half an hour or what, or 20 minutes, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, how much fuel they had, but they, they flew just around and around. If they saw a, a, a vehicle, it made no difference what, military or private, or, they would come down and shoot the hell out of that thing. And I seen with my own eyes, because I was there, uh, they would fly around and if they didn't find anything, they could not go back to base I guess with a full load of bombs of ammunition. But the farmers at that time still had their cows and horses on the field, like they do over here. Well, somebody must have had a crazy idea, and at least them two planes that I saw, the first 
guy, first fighter plane came real low and started chasing the cows and the horses. And the second one came and shot everything to a kingdom come. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, you know, that was, you said, what the hell is all that about? You know, you, you see they're going after cows and horses inst instead of, you know, after whatever. But that's the way it was. Uh, and, and that's what I saw with my own eyes. So oh, that's all I can tell you. Now, going there, uh, getting to the place, uh, well, the bombing in the big city started so bad. And like I told you, I was taken away from my mother and my father. So my mother decided she was afraid that she would die under all the bombs in, in Essen, in, in, in that industrialized town I came from. So she came back to southern Germany and got me and said, I remember that, she says, that, you know, if, if I have to die, we die together. She was really concerned that she was going to die of my father. Uh, so she came back and says, if we die, we all die together. So I went back to Essen in this mess with all the bombs and all this craziness. Uh, the city of, of Essen looked like you see today on TV the way it goes in, uh, in, in the Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's just a disaster. That this can't go on the streets anymore because uh, the houses had collapsed. And, and, uh, uh, but for a young kid, uh, no school, it, it was nice in a way. I mean, it, I, I, if I tell you something else, then I must be lying. So I had a lot of friends with some, f with a lot of uh, good times with some friends, and the houses that burned out completely, and only the four walls were there. We had watched some people uh, and tore the rest of the house down to make it more safe, you know, for people to go on the street and for cars. So even so, we were small, and there always was an older guy that was a wise guy, you know, that was two, three years older than us. So we started to take uh, this walls down. And that we didn't get killed by our, you know, was amazing. But that's, that's what we did, and nobody said anything, because there was nobody to, there to say anything. Uh, the police, obviously, uh, the one time we, we, we knocked uh, some bricks off the first floor, and we didn't know at the moment a policeman <laughs> walked by and one of the bricks hit him and they have a shackle with some cocaine sticking up and luckily he had that helmet on and it broke off that shackle and and uh, he wasn't too happy so he, he waited for us because we had to climb down from the second floor back to the first floor and uh, he marched us to our parents and our parents uh, the, the police in Germany, they, they, they made the parents responsible for you. They didn't do nothing to you, but they went to the parents and let the riot act to them. And, and they, they, my father was at work and uh, uh, my mother had to listen to it and she was afraid that, that they were going to arrest her. She didn't do anything, but mm -hmm. apparently she didn't uh, instruct us what to do and what not to do. That's the way I look at it. Uh, my father had a plumbing business. Uh, he was in the First World War. In the Second World War, <coughs> plumbers and electricians didn't have to go, so to speak of, because after every bombing raid, uh, the water system was, you know, busted up on the street, the pipes were broken, and, and, and the same is electric. And even so, in essence, a, a lot of the electric was underground, not above ground like you see here. But every time a bomb hit a street, well, that, that broke up the, you know, the, the system. So uh, my father, being a plumber, <coughs> he, ha he worked with Italian and uh, French prisoners. They would dig up the street expose the broken pipes and then my father would come and fix it and then they would you know close the hole again and and made it uh, uh, walkable or drivable for cars uh, the uh, french prisoners and italian prisoners they always had a fire going and they always asked us for potatoes so the first time in my life i saw this uh, uh, baked potatoes or what you call it. They took the potato, roll them 
in, in some kind of paper that they had and threw them in, in the fire. Now, my mother knew that, that, that you know, these people needed some food. So my, my mother gave me the potatoes. If my father would have known, I probably still would have blue and black spots on my behind because fathers are different. You know, fathers have to fight. They get killed and have to kill people. Mothers look at it different, I found out. And, and if you're a mother in China, Russia, or here, or anywhere, uh, a mother has a different idea because when she looks at a small a kid, at eight, 19 years old, doesn't eat much, she can visualize that her son has to go to war, becomes a prisoner, that she hopes that somebody, you know, has mercy on, on, on that. On that why the mothers are a little different in the war. They will feed uh, and, and make sure that some of the prisoners, if you have access to it, of course, you know, that they get a little bit to eat and a little bit of extra and, and, and uh, not so much love, but a little care and that, and, and which is good. I, 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 uh, uh, I think uh, that's a mother state that we guys don't have. You know, we get killed and uh, sure we, we get mad and, and when we get a prisoner, we might not be too, uh, too nice with them, you know. So anyway, so I experienced that and, and that's a good experience. Uh, uh, I think it's a good trade of mothers and, and, uh, and everybody has a mother. They, they probably uh, know uh, how their mother would act or how uh, not. So uh, my, uh, when the bombing started getting really bad and I was in, in southern part of Germany, my mother came and got me back and like I told her and, and said, hey, if, we, if I have to die, then we die all together. But then the bombing got, uh, so then, then from that on in, I was nine years old, so close to nine years. I don't have a brother and I don't have a sister. So I grew out of clothing and it was very hard to, to buy clothing for anything. Everything went to the army, especially leather items. There were no shoes, there was nothing. And, and uh, even regular clothing was hard. Now my mother was a master seamstress. She could make new out of old. Mm -hmm. And that's how basically my father worked but not for money, he worked for bread or, or, you know, for food. And my mother used to go on the farms two, three, four hours away from Essen State, two weeks uh, and, and uh, at a farm and, and would uh, make new clothing for the ladies from old stuff, more modern. You know, she would take it apart and then make it more modern. And she also, when she came back, she had a suitcase full of everything of butter and bread and meat and, and uh, vegetables and all that. And that's how we survived in a big city. Uh, everything was rationed. I remember uh, many times my mother would stay in one line, in one store, and I would stay in another line in the store. And by the time we got to the front, they had ran out. Uh, you know, they had no supermarkets. Uh, they were all mom and pop businesses. Uh, they were selling, uh, uh, sugar and stuff like that by quarter pound out of a little bag because that's the way it came you know nobody had sacks and and boxes full of stuff like you go in a supermarket here there were no supermarkets and, and everything of course was ration you had a ration card and, and, and uh, uh, they punched it uh, when they gave you uh, they, they sold butter an eighth of a pound that was an ration card. I mean, that was just a spoonful, mm -hmm. you know, but that's the way it went. And that's the way everybody lived and I got used to it. Uh, I guess nobody liked it, but uh, uh, we were in a way, the older ones were indoctrinated that, you know, it was a for war effort that uh, the soldiers had to get it first. And of course, with the bombing, some of the railroads didn't work anymore. and and there was a very limited uh, transportation. All the trucks went to the army uh, because they shut, you know, in, an ar in, a, in a war, the army loses a lot of vehicles. So if you, my uncle had a coal business and he had two trucks 
and they confiscated two tucks and he says I'm not going to leave my tucks alone because he worked too hard for it and and he went uh, volunteered as a soldier and for his two tucks you know to drive to at least drive one uh, and he became later on a prisoner in, in Russia and he didn't come home till 19 I guess 1949 because he was also a diesel mechanic and the Russians used him to uh, to fix American trucks and their trucks and he told me that once uh, they were more, no more spare parts or the parts from shut up trucks they let him go he, unfortunately he died of TB two month, two weeks two years after he came back from from uh, the Russian prison camp let me ask, let me ask you this. what kind of information was the German government giving giving to you you remember, like, um, were you getting information exclusively through the government about the status of the war? Was there any? There was. There was practically ten times a day, or what? There was, and of course, there was propaganda. They only talked about what the Germans accomplished. You know, the armed army took this town in Poland, and then they went into Russia, and and you know, they they even got the visit. They, they saw the buildings in front of for Stal Stalingrad in Moscow. That's how far in they were. And, uh, and especially with U-boats, the Germans, are, I've, they must have had 50, 100 U-boats <coughs> in the Atlantic and, and all over the place. And every time a, a U-boat torpedo or a freighter or a what, that was big news on the radio. There was no TV, but there was certain music that they played and, and uh, they said, uh, you know, a special report that, that uh, you so-and-so <coughs> <coughs> uh, torpedoed this freighter from there or this, from this country and they, they knew uh, what the tonnage was. So it, it got, and they said that the tonnage that was torpedoed was 120 or 2,000 or however. They all knew the, the boats, you know, apparently when the boats were made, uh, that was a common thing to, to tell the whole world, uh, you know, what the boat's name was and what the tonnage that they could carry. Mm -hmm. So that way, and, and that was a big thing, and the Germans hung on the radio and they would love to, to hear all that stuff. You talk about propaganda. Um, what about, like, Hitler Youth? Was there, how did that work? Would, would they go into the schools to recruit? Or, or? <laughs> no, that in the big cities, <coughs> like with me, uh, when, uh, by the time you were 10, they were expecting you to join. And I know in some instances where they actually went and, and, uh, and asked the parents, you know, to, to register their son. Now with me, was, I was nine years old. I had no, uh, no brother, no sister. So hand-me-downs, they were no hand-me-downs. But my, my mother had always nice clothes for me. Oh, she made of old, new, like I told you. Matter of fact, she made a, a Eisenhower jacket for me. And when I had it on in Germany, <coughs> while the war was on and even later, people would stop me on the street and says, where I bought this jacket? And it was that nice looking. The Germans had never seen one jacket like that. But uh, when the war, the last six, seven months, we were uh, we were in 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 southern Germany. Uh, what happened one, once my mother had uh, brought me back to town and things got so bad, then the government said that all the women and children could leave. So since I was already knew some people in southern Germany, and the farmer that I, that had taken me in for a year or so, so we went there. Uh, and uh, uh, I lost my train of uh, what the heck I was going to say. Uh, I uh, well, I ended up in 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 there, and and with the with the Hitler use, uh, my a friend of my father had told told him, why don't you volunteer your son for the Hitler use? They still issue uniforms and shoes, and since I had no shoes, the only shoes I had were with a with a wooden sole, and the top was canvas, and you cannot run with a wooden shoes. I mean, there's no way, because it doesn't bend, you know. 
So uh, my mother, that following week, marched me to the, the, the Hitler Youth Office, which wasn't too far, and uh, they said, sure. And uh, uh, they gave her a ration book, and then with the ration book, I could go in town to one of the big stores that handled clothing. And uh, I got leather shoes and I got the whole uniform and that picture that, that I have there. That is the stuff that I was issued. Uh, the uniform that I got was exactly like the Hitler Youth uniform. Even so, I was in the first group. The first group was called DJs, Deutsches Jungvolk, German Young Folk. And from 14, you were in the big boys in the Hitler Youth. Once you were in a Hitler Youth, you could uh, volunteer, and some didn't volunteer, they were just put there. You could, uh, you would work on searchlights at night, and you helped at the uh, anti-aircraft gun by opening ammunition boxes and then bringing, uh, you know, ammunition to the, to, to the guns and whatever had to be done. Is that something they had you do? Yeah, no, I never did that. No. I, I, when, I went to the office and every Saturday, uh, because in Essen there was no military, but there were unbelievable amounts of, of anti-aircraft guns because they were trying to protect the crop factories. But the place that I was, they used us on a Saturday morning. The first thing we, we when we would get there, we, we would sing some songs and also I learned with nine years, I learned how to shoot. So, <laughs> a little, when I was in the army later on, even some ahead of myself here, and, and uh, when I saw how the recruits, that they couldn't shoot and they couldn't march, I said, my God, I said, I learned that stuff when I was nine years old and I had everybody laughing. <laughs> yeah. Before we move on any further, what, which one is you in this photograph? Here, the one with the uniform. Okay. See, when you look real close, you see. Uh, so, uh, uh, we'll have to scan this, I guess. I, ha I have a belt on and, and uh, uh, you know, a kerchief that was black. Mm -hmm. The uniform was brown, the pants was black. No, now, the uniform distinguished itself from the Hitler Youth uniform from the big boys only in one way. The Hitler Youth used an armband with a swastika the big boys. We used a ruin on, on the left arm. A what? I guess it's called a ruin or what a ruin. Okay. You know the SS had two of them. Okay. Whatever you call them yeah. things. You know, we used one of them. Because you were younger? Yeah. Okay. So we didn't use a uh, we didn't use an armband with a swastika on it. Even okay. so there were some units uh, that all, all over Germany that in the winter time they did have uh, we had a, what we call a ski uniform in the winter time which was all dark blue blackish kind of and was from wool and that uniform sometimes had an armband with a swastika on it. Gotcha. I never had that. I, I only had that one <coughs> and the, we had a Hitler use pin and it was a DJ pin. I have them on my table there uh, the Hitler Youth pin was a regular pin with a swastika. We could wear that if we wanted it, but what it was issued to me originally was a belt buckle with this one rune and was a pin with this one rune. But it was optional and most of us, uh, we liked the Hitler Youth thing anyway because it had a swastika on it and, and it looked uh, so much better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, youth, uh, <coughs> getting the uniform, I was... Uh, the king of Cambodia, you know, I I was uh, I was some somebody now all of a sudden. Before yeah. I was nobody. Now I was a guy. Hey, I had a brand new uniform, everything nice and shiny, and and uh, I was real proud of it. Uh, and so was everybody else. When my kids grew up and they became uh, Boy Scouts, that first group in the Boy Scouts is the bigger bigger laws or what they call them. Vibolos? yeah, Vibolos. <coughs> so we were, basically, I compare that to yeah. the same thing, that the Vibolos and then later on Boy Scouts. And of course, we <coughs> we learned how to shoot. And I had a, I have a sports badge that I got when I was 10 years old, uh, which, you know, you had to run 
and sour ball, or, and sometimes uh, we even threw uh, 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 dummy hand grenades. For real. You know. But anyway, so on Saturdays we we f we, we we had uh, shooting for an hour. We sang some songs, and they were army songs. Some were even as old as World War One. When you came in the building, there was a big picture of Hitler, but nobody ever into, you know, tried to in, induct me into Hitler's thinking or that stuff. You walked just past it, and, and the guys that ran the outfit, I imagine the bigger Hitler used boys, they, they you know, were uh, uh, more, uh, what you would call it, more. Uh, likable to Hitler than we were. You know, when you eight, nine, ten years old, <laughs> you don't know what the hell is going yeah. on. You know, you are, only your eyes see what your eyes see, like this teacher told me later in the, in, in the high school. And uh, he, he was right. You, uh, uh, But today, uh, people, sometimes I listen to people that were in a Hitler youth and, and uh, uh, and they tell stories that I never saw in two years and never heard. So uh, I, they could have been lying, they could have made it up, and some they, they feel important by really adding it on. Uh, I only felt, felt important I had, a, I had a nice uniform. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, uh, I know when my kids grew up and they became vigorous and they had a brand new Boy Scouts uniform, I saw them the same thing. The first two months, uh, they didn't want to take it off because, you know, even so they looked at the size of the mirror, they looked nice. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, of course, it wears off. So on Saturdays, then, usually we got some ration. Uh, they had a, a big pot that they made soup. Uh, and each, each one of us got a, a, a cup of this, this, whatever that was. It, was a, it tasted okay. And uh, then we went out in the field on highways, and we dug, we dug trenches along the highway, so 30 yards on either side from the highway. And the idea was that when the truck drivers or anybody in a car came and got attacked by fighter planes, they would jump out of the car and go in this fox house. That's what they were. And if they came back out, and they still could drive the car or talk, obviously they did, otherwise they waited uh, till somebody came and and uh, directed them away or, or fixed it or whatever. So uh, that's what we did every Saturday in the afternoon for three, four hours. Uh, even so we were small, they gave us a shovel and a pick and, and uh, there always were some leaders that the leaders all were 18 or 19 years old. And they told us what to do. They marked it off, and they said, "You put one here, put a hole there, put a hole here," and and it worked because a, a lot of people got saved, uh, you know, jumping into this foxhole, because the fighter planes weren't really after people; they were after equipment, you know, trucks and stuff like that. Even so, a few years later, in in the southern part, where they went after horses and cows and because they didn't have any else to shoot, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that sticks with you when you see that, that they just shoot cows and, and horses for nothing. Uh, you wonder what the heck is going on. And then as you get older, little by little, you get some more brains and you realize the war is going on and, and uh, uh, mom and, and pop, they worry about you, you know, they tell you how you're up to this, to that. You know, in a bunker, mom is only worried about you, and and uh, the rest doesn't matter. And and uh, so. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember toward the end of the war how you found out the war was over? How did you find that out? That well, we were in in southern Germany at that time, and we could hear the guns coming closer, and we thought, well, if the guns are that close, uh, the the war gotta be lost. We were like hundreds of miles away from from France. We were in the southern part of Germany and uh, but that's close to Italy so the Americans came through the southern part and uh, over the Alps and and uh, the Americans came uh, I guess both were Americans. They, they came the regular route from France right through Germany. 
And then on uh, on a radio, you couldn't hear this propaganda anymore. All of a sudden, it was was uh, uh, kind of quiet, except Goebbels, who was the propaganda minister. Uh, uh, he still was on radio, trying to encourage everybody that that uh, you know that we had secret weapons. I don't know if you heard that before. That the V2 was one of them secret weapons. And, and uh, Dr. von Braun, uh, this guy that, that developed this, when the war was over, you know, he ended up in the U.S. and makes and, and is responsible that we got to the moon or got all that stuff. And he became a citizen like me later on. So, uh, in the town I was in, uh, all of a sudden things got quiet. Nobody was, uh, and it was a farm town, maybe. Uh, mile and a half long and on both sides of the road they had the farmhouses because the rest was all farmland for miles and miles and and there were all these little towns here or here or here and uh, all of a sudden we heard some commotion and a company of french moroccan soldiers came through they were all moroccans and the officers were, were french uh, after a while, uh, and, and they came, and, and we had a town crier, or whatever it's called. He would come with a bell uh, on a bicycle, and he stop here, and then he goes maybe 300 yards more, gets off the bike, rings a bell, and read the latest information, what had to be done, and how to behave, and all this stuff. <coughs> and they came in and said, you got to turn in all the cameras, you had to turn in all your radios, you had to turn in all all kinds of stuff and uh, since my mother was a seamstress uh, they came and and they wanted something i don't know exactly how that went anymore they wanted something from my mother my mother said that, why you want that and she says i make a living with it so then, then believe it or not the officers came and she had to make the french had long coats up to here and she had to cut them and make Eisenhower jackets that they saw from the U.S. soldiers. They said, can you do this? And my mother said, sure, you know, that, that's my job. So uh, all the stuff that they had confiscated from us, they brought back. The officer said, we don't need your stuff. So, so uh, they liked what my mother was doing. And uh, once in a, they didn't bring us any food, but uh, they brought our stuff back and, and didn't give us any hard time or whatever. One night, uh, the town still has street lights, but during the war, war they were turned off and some of them they were covered with, with some stuff and the light was very dim. I mean, you could see a little bit, but not before. So <laughs> the moment the war was over, uh, they took the covers off the lamps and here comes a bunch of Moroccan guys stark naked with machine pistols and blew out all the lights on, on this... You were naked? <laughs> naked. i never seen anything like it. They, they were drunk, yeah. you know, and uh, brrr, this machine. Now, and of course, everybody jumps on the window, wants to see what's what. And then when they saw light on the window, because all the windows also had covers and draperies, uh, you know, for so that planes couldn't see any lights at night, uh, if you got on a window and you turn on the light, they would aim the guns at the house, at, the, at your window, and then shut all the windows out. <laughs> so, so you learned a lot. And, so and these this Moroccan. And, and these guys, uh, they must have been recruits or what. I swear, I never saw, I mean, I was in the army. Uh, these guys, all day long, they were on a firing range and they must have blown away millions of rounds. I mean, all day long, blah, 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 machine gun fire and, and their targets. So that, so I can only visualize that these guys were recruits and they learned how to shoot in Germany. <laughs> so let's talk about, that's extremely interesting, but there's a turn of events. So how do you end up becoming a German boy and then how do you get to the United States? What's the story behind that? Well, uh, as I grew older and I, and, and I took apprenticeship training at AEG, which is the, the uh, 
competition from Siemens. A lot of people know Siemens electric outfit. Yeah. And AEG was uh, the equivalent also to Siemens. They still exist today, but not as big as they were. So I became an electrician machinist. And in 1950, I had an uncle that went to the US here in the 30s, early 30s. And uh, he said, if I and an uncle of mine, if we wanted to come to the US, he would uh, uh, vouch for us. Well, there wasn't much going on. Uh, I finished apprenticeship training and my father, he would have loved for me to become a plumber because he had a plumbing business. But I've seen twice my dad standing shit up to his knees, you know, one of, one of the, and, them, and he took care of big apartment houses, five, six stories high. And and uh, when somebody threw something in a toilet and it got clogged up, it all ended up in a, in a basement. Uh, and twice I had to take him lunch and uh, that, uh, and, when I got there and I saw him up to here, I said, I'm not going to become a plumber. So I went home to my mother and I said, Dad, I'm not going to become a plumber. I said, it's too stinky and too whatever. And and uh, and my father never said anything. He, he never stood in the way. He never, and the, the business, he had taken it over from his father. The business was established in 1886 or whatever. So, so it was pretty old already. And and uh, but I I just didn't like the uh, <laughs> had to become a plumber. So when this uncle said I could come, and Germany still was destroyed, you know, in in the fifties, they were just about through the Marshall Plan. They were just about getting ready. The Marshall Plan was in force already. But anything with the, that the government does, you know, that takes months or years to get it going. So on by 52, little by little, they were trying to, uh, uh, you know, to rebuild the cities and and uh, and anybody that that had a chance to, to, especially to the U.S. Because I believed that there were, you know, chickens flying around. All you had to do is grab one. I mean, that's how we, we got indoctrinated. And uh, and uh, uh, so when I had a chance to come here. I said, okay, I said, I'm I'm going. And it took a year or so for the paperwork and back and forth. Uh, I spent uh, a whole day at the embassy in Bremerhaven and uh, I got uh, checked that I was super healthy from my toes to my hair. And uh, then I had to sign papers that if I would get drafted that I would go willingly or they could send me back to, to Germany. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, Johnson was the president that did away with it. It that lasted as long as John, till Johnson was president and for some reason he didn't like it or what. Uh, uh, and you know, a lot of it is political, uh, the, the way that works out sometimes. But anyway, I got drafted at, at the, so I, I got to the U.S. I only spent two months here in Reading, and the owner to me, uh, since he spoke German, came to me and said in, uh, what, in year, a, what year was this? That you entered 1952. 1952. So, uh, uh, and I came here, believe it, on Hitler's birthday, April 20th. Oh, no. And about two months later, I ended up in Puerto Rico. I had no clue where Puerto Rico was. I, I was very well, we Germans, you know, know uh, a lot about, you know, Argentina and U.S., England and all that. They, 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 uh, they told us pretty well, but uh, since Puerto Rico was just a dot, you know, on the a, on a map, uh, so uh, nobody ever told me that Puerto Rico was, we knew about Cuba, but uh, no Puerto Rico. So uh, when he told me that uh, we were, that the factory was being transferred to uh, uh, to Puerto Rico because the uh, Puerto Rican government wanted to industrialize uh, Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico at that time was a banana colony. You know, what they had bananas and pineapples and 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 that was about it. There was no industry, so they asked a bunch of industry 
you know, in general, they ask people, uh, you know, to come to Puerto Rico and the owners that then, uh, the fact is that five years uh, tax free, because they didn't have to pay any tax at all to the U.S. or to Puerto Rico. And of course, that must have been a very, you know, uh, interesting for people that had a company, you know, for five years, no taxes. So I went with them uh, because the owner could uh, speak German and I only spoke German. So when I got to Puerto Rico, I didn't know that they spoke Spanish. Uh, when I heard the Spanish sounded me like a machine gun, blah, 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 blah. I ran all right out to my pants. I said, I might come back. I said, I don't understand anybody. Nobody understands me. It's too hot. I wasn't used to 90 degrees and I never saw 90 degrees heat in Germany. I just couldn't remember that. Yeah. And, and uh, so it took me about a year and a half to, to get acclimatized in, you know, to, to, uh, to get used to the heat in the, on the bus. I was wet from here to here. It looked like I had made in my pants and people would look at me like that and say, did this guy make in his pants? I'm the only guy on a bus soaking wet. But that's the way it was, yeah. you know, that took a year and a half for me to, they, might, they said till your blood gets sin or whatever, I, I don't know. But anyway, so after a year and a half, it was okay. I didn't sweat that anymore. So I'm in Puerto Rico four and a half years, four years, and I get a, a, a dear letter from the, from the uh, draft board. And it was very nicely written, we welcome you, blah, blah, blah. And I should have saved that, but I remember I gave it back to them. And uh, the letter came to me in San Juan at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. By 11 o'clock, I was supposed to be in Harrisburg for induction into the army. Mm -hmm. The letter was on the road for two months. They had sent that slow boat to China with a three cent stamp, and the boat must have went to China first and then came back to Puerto Rico. So, uh, and I had to, I had to work every Saturday. I took the letter. Matter of fact, the mail got to the office. That was my address. So I shouted to the boss, and the boss said, "Well, he made a phone call, and the the, the office for induction or whatever it was was still open." And they said, "Well, can you bring your employee and the letter?" So he says, "Get ready in five minutes. We're going there and there." So we went there, and they looked at the letter. They said, "Yeah." And I think that's where I heard the first time slow boat to China because one of the guys must have said, oh, this letter came by slow boat to China. That's when I learned that expression. So, and then they said, well, you can't be in Harrisburg, but you're here, you reported. He said, so you did your, you know, you did what you had to do. And they said, you want to enter the army in, in, in Harrisburg or San Juan? And I said, no, I said, since I'm here, I said, but I don't care, but then you have to say, give me a ticket to Harrisburg. And they said, no, that's probably not going to happen. And this is in 52? 52. No, that was 56, though. 56, so four years in Puerto so, Rico. Yeah, four years in Puerto Rico. And I was 23 and a half already by that time. I was, in, you know, one of the older ones that got drafted. Uh -huh. Most guys got drafted, you know, at 20, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, they said, well, so I said, I, I enter in San Juan. It took eight months for the letter to go back to Harrisburg and come back with the approval that I could enter the army in San Juan. So, so, I'm, so then I coined, after I was in the army, I coined the word German-American, German and Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. okay? So I said, uh, I was the only German-American that the army had at that time, see? And uh, I stayed two weeks in, uh, in San Juan, got the uniform and all that stuff that, that, that they do. And uh, they said, you're not gonna stay here. And I said, what do you mean by that? They said, well, anybody that speaks English gets shipped out to the US. And the Puerto Ricans that didn't speak English, they stayed and learned English. But since I only spoke English, not too much Puerto Rican, not so much Spanish. So uh, they put me in charge of 25 Puerto Ricans on a way to Fort Dix and, and over Charleston, North Carolina, or whatever. 
and and that was a joke by itself because the Puerto Rican says, "Hey, he says you like us. We're not going to have to listen to you." <laughs> you know, but mm -hmm. somebody had to be in charge. So since I was taller than everybody, I guess uh, <coughs> somebody in San Juan in the army said, "Hey, we put this guy in charge, and and uh, he can take his 25 guys." So I ended up in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, for Dix, New Jersey, I took uh, six weeks, eight weeks of infantry training. Then I hung around for a week. They didn't know really what to do. That there was a problem still in Korea or what? I don't know. The war was over in Korea, but uh, uh, finally they decided that, uh, uh, and 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 there we had to take tests and stuff like that. And they decided that. I was better off being uh, being in the office than being, I guess, an infantry guy. You know, it strictly went on the IQ. And I still say that the, the people I served with in, in, in Germany was an ammunition outfit. Them guys, their IQ couldn't have been more than 63. I mean, that, that was crazy. <laughs> that, that was insane. But anyway, so I ended up in the... in, in uh, uh, in the office in an ammunition outfit. I was the interpreter when I got there. The captain didn't know that I was coming. I got there on a Sunday morning. Got, got where? To, to Germany. Germany okay. Where at Germany? In uh, 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 Grafenwehr Wilsack. Would this still be 1956? Uh, that was 50, Yeah, that was 57 already. Okay. Because I got drafted in, in November of 56. Gotcha. <clears throat> so uh, then I reported on Monday morning to the captain, you know, I saluted, you know, Private Fister, uh, reporting for duty. He looked at my papers and he saw that I was German. He said, are you born in Germany? I said, yeah. I, I said, you speak German? I said, sure. I said, I lived here 18, 19 years. And, uh, the captain got off his chair, put his hands up in the air and says, oh my God, you must be sent by God. He was so happy to get a guy that spoke German yeah. because in the late 50s, early 60s, not many Germans spoke English. Today, you cannot graduate unless you t speak two other languages besides German mm. and perfect. I mean, you got to be able to hold a conversation like I now do with you, I know. And, and uh, so today you don't find anybody that doesn't speak uh, uh, English. When, when my sister's kids <coughs> came over here, my kids, they looked at me, they looked at you, and they said, hey, they never were here and they speak perfect English. Mm -hmm. But the school system is so much different in yeah. Germany than it is over here. And in Germany, uh, the, the sport is after school. You, you, uh, uh, you hook up as an amateur team an amateur club, so to speak. And that's where you do the sports after school over here. My kids were over here in a high school, not too far from here. And all they were interested in was football. I mean, the school itself. They didn't care if the kids learned anything the way I saw it. And I was upset about that because I wasn't used to that. You know, my, uh, I, I started to do sports after I came out of school and, and so, so, so in Germany, what, what what unit were you in at that time? I was in a in a ammunition. It, it was a battalion. It had four companies, and each company worked with ammunition. It was an ammunition supply company. So I in Grafenberg Wilsack, which was the biggest uh, uh, training area that the Germans had, and of course the U.S. took it over. Uh, uh, you could uh, shoot the biggest guns there and, and the tanks. Also, the 7th Army Tank Training Center was, was there. So, uh, when I heard that I was going to go there, <coughs> it was about 20 kilometers from the Czech border. And across the Czech border, uh, there were 500 T-34 Russian tanks at Cold War waiting to go. And, and uh, I wasn't real happy about that uh, uh, because the problem was I wasn't a citizen. 
right, and I served in the U.S. Army. Knowing what the Russians did to 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 the Spanish and to some guys that were born German and fought on the German side, if they could figure out that you would were not a German, they shot you in the neck. No prisoners, no nothing. They they had no mercy for that. So I knew that, and and I wasn't too happy being stationed there, because there were other places they could have put me. But apparently, you know, they they put you. I guess where they needed the most, and they needed a ter interpreter really bad. So uh, I've been there for a while, and uh, the lieutenant, he was a uh, uh, West Point graduate, came to me one day, and he, he says, uh, you know where we at? I said, yeah, I said, I know where we at. <coughs> and I said, I also know what's going to happen to me when the war breaks out. I said, I got to get rid of the uniform and, and run as fast as I can. I said, the good part is, since I wasn't a citizen, I still had my German pass. And I could have pulled that off probably in one form or another, you know, just saying I'm German. And, and uh, the problem also was that we had no infantry, nothing to back us up. We were an outfit and, uh, and they were misfits. There was no, I mean, some guys, they were constantly in trouble, and that's why they needed an interpreter. I had to go to the police, I had to go here, and you know, guys were in jail, and of course they didn't speak German, the police didn't speak English. <coughs> so I did a lot of that stuff, till one day I got, got too fancy, and, and I told the captain, I said, I'm done with interpretation, because the people would get right in my face and would scream at me because of this guy, not because of me, but you know, the, Taking it out of you. Yeah, you know, and I went to the captain, I said, I, I don't want to do it anymore. He didn't say anything and he says, you uh, 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 are these sort of what I could go. Well, a week later, it's on a bulletin board. Now I'm official interpreter because I didn't have an, uh, an MS. Uh, MOS as an, an interpreter. I was just a, a clerk, you know, a company clerk. Mm -hmm. So when I told him I want to do it anymore, well, he put out a battalion, send an order that, uh, that uh, and by that time I think I had one stripe that PFC Fisto is hereby, uh, 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 the way they heard it, that, you know, official interpreter. And then I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but so, it, it was okay. I, uh, so if you spent your whole time in Germany? Mm -hmm. to so 50... No, I, I, 1962? I, I spent two years and then of course uh, I, I had two years of active duty, you know, afterwards. And then two years of inactive and I got discharged in 1962, six gotcha. years later. Gotcha. Okay. When, when did your active status end? In, in my active started in uh, 56, November 56. That's when it started, and then, then you got And I got discharged in 62. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. See, and, and uh, now, I was lucky to get out because I was mad and I had one child. And the Vietnam War started. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all the guys that were in the army, they had a hell of a time getting discharged because, uh, you know, they needed them guys. But since I was married and had a child, that made a big difference. So, you know, they let me go. And, and uh, which was okay. I mean, if, if I would have, I liked the army. I had no, I never had any problems with the army. I kept my nose clean. <coughs> I had certain privileges uh, in the army that hardly anybody ever had because the captain liked me and, and I did the best I could, you know. Uh, so um, we got a lot of young guys walking around here, um, you know, teenagers. One of them would come up to you and say, hey, I'm thinking about joining the Army. What, what advice would you give them to be successful in the military? Well, first of all, you got to know what you're getting into and you got to be able to take uh, orders, okay? You got to keep your nose clean. If you can't do that, the army is not for you because they might even throw you out and you get an undesirable discharge. And that's the worst because when you go somewhere and, and uh, 
and look for a responsible job in a government or what with a dishonorable discharge, you go nowhere. Okay, so so uh, my son talked to a guy from the Air Force, but he wanted to get away from me because we German fathers are a, a little, maybe be a little crazy, but uh, my kids grew up the way I grew up, and I said to my kids, sit down, that's what I meant. Not, I didn't want to talk five times to them, it was sit down, and then five minutes later I have to talk. When I said sit down, that's what I meant, okay? Girls had to be home by 10, boys by 11. Of course, they didn't like it, but I always told them, well, you picked the wrong father. I said, yeah, you know, it was that simple, because that's what I had to, yeah. to live with in Germany. When I left Germany, my father said goodbye, and, and he said, don't ever drag my name through the dirt. He said, I come after you with a big stick. And I told that to my kids. I said, this is when I left Germany. That's one of the last words my father told me. And I said, I haven't forgotten it. And I said, and I expect the same from you. So I have four kids, two girls, two boys. <coughs> uh, two have a master's degree and, and two just college degree. They stayed out of trouble. Uh, now they're my the third child is 60 years, the one, well, 58, 60, 62, and 40, and 42. That's how old they are. But I'm 88 years old, you know, so. And they kept, uh, I mean, they became responsible citizens because I insisted on that. One time my wife must have found some smelly stuff in my, in, in, my, in the youngest boy's pocket, and I don't know if it's marijuana or marijuana or whatever it was. I don't smoke that stuff, and I have no clue what that smells like. But my wife, first for two months, didn't say anything. And then she said, you know, uh, Robert has this stuff in his pocket. So I talked to my son, Robert, I said, hey, you know, time out. This is not gonna work, and you'll be surprised. Uh, I said, so keep your nose clean. And I said, I hope I don't have to tell you anything more. Once my oldest daughter raised the hand towards me, like if she wanted to hit me, well, I grabbed her like this and I put her against the wall and lifted her with one hand. I said, young lady, in this house, I'm the boss, okay? You do what I tell you. And, uh, and I said, if you don't like it here, I said, I got news for you. So I opened the front door put her on a porch, closed the door. I said, when you have enough, come back in. But well, five minutes later, she came in and that did it. You know, uh, when it comes to kids, uh, somebody got to be in charge. And you can't let them run over you. And and uh, my wife obviously looked, uh, looked the other way once in a while. She was that equivalent that is needed. You know, I'm too tough and she, you know, balances the thing out. <coughs> So, so speaking about kids, you know, this will be the last question to wrap it up. Um, we're videotaping, obviously, and we're going to send you a copy of the video. Oh, we're going to send nice, you yeah. instructions on how you can send your video to the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. That will be that will be kept there for thousands of years. Oh, okay. A couple hundred years from now, when your great-great-great-grandkids stumble upon the video, what would you want them to know about your service to America? I was proud to serve. Okay, that's why I came here. I signed it, <coughs> and I do what, you know, I do what I say. <coughs> you, uh, being here, you have to be a responsible citizen. You don't have to be a pain in the butt, and, and you know, if you don't like it here, why you're here? Okay, that's very important to me. Okay, people complain, and, and, and I tell them, and I give talks, I said, if you don't like it here, why are you here? I said, go to uh, to Africa. They got all the sand. They let you play in the sand for eight hours a day. And when you come back, they give you a suitcase full of sand for free. I said, then you find out where you are and the, you know and what happened. And and I'm very adamant about it. Uh, I came here because I wanted to be here, you know. And I will defend this country till till I die. Uh, I have done very well in this country. I started here at a dollar an hour, spoke no English. The day I owned a company I started with, 
company is 76 years old, so I've been there over 50, 60 years probably, okay? I came here with uh, 19 years old after six months, they made me the foreman because I was so much better in, in, uh, in making things and fixing machines than anybody that they had over there, so uh, and that was tough. Uh, 19, 20 year old kid tells 40, 50 years old what to do. You know, but, but the owner saw the potential that I had, and, and uh, so we went from there. Uh, so again, it's, it's, uh, uh, and keep your nose clean, you know, don't do anything crazy. Don't do anything crazy that uh, even years from now you feel sorry about. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't use loose women, uh, you know, and that all goes together. Uh, a lot of it obviously comes from your father and your mother how there and that in my house they know three letter words. You you use some of these bad words so you got a problem with me. There is no use for that. And I tell my kids when they got married, I said, and especially uh, the, the two girls, I said, if you get a boyfriend that uses his full language, I said, stay away. You're never gonna amount to anything with a guy like that. You never move up, you know. You never become somebody uh, if if you, if that's your language. Uh, uh, become a good citizen, you know. It it, uh, uh, it doesn't take much to be nice. And I was taught as a young kid, do especially during the war, we helped the old people cross this roads, you know, that were all full of stones, and and you know the houses had collapsed, and they had a heck of a time maneuvering the streets. So we used to help the old people and, and I installed that in my children. I said, you know, if you see an old person, even so you in a hurry, I said, help that person. The, the minute that it takes uh, uh, comes back to you many times. I said, God, I mean, I'm not a, you know, a, relig a religious guy, but I believe that sooner or later it comes back and I tell him, I said, God will award you for that. And, and uh, so far, my, my kids done good. Like I said, I have two of his master's degrees and two of his college degrees. Nobody ever got arrested. <laughs> Nobody ever, as far as I know, smoked this stuff. You know, they, the one had a couple of drinks and, and uh, here and there, but not uh, excessive that, that he didn't know where he was. And, and I wouldn't allow it anyway. I would, even today, I probably would go after them. <laughs> so, I, you know, and I would tell him like my father told me when I left Germany. He, he said, "Don't drag my name for the dirt. I come after you." And, and I believe in that. That's uh, all good advice. Well, thank it. you for coming in and, and telling us your fascinating story. And more importantly, thank you for your service to America. Okay, thank you. Pleasure to meet I you. I appreciate it. Well, same here.